Well, hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second seminar. Uh, I am Anastasia Babulal, and I'll take us through the events of this seminar. So in this second seminar, our presenter will highlight some of the skills and competencies our petroleum geoscience students have attained or are attaining and connect with the role geoscience can play in a transforming society. Some guidelines before we start. If you would like to, to ask a question, please post them in the chat option below. Questions will be answered at the end of Professor Jackson's presentation and as time permits. Allow me to present the Head of Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, Professor Rafi Hussein, to share a few words of welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Babulal. Uh, good morning, students and colleagues. I am Rafi Hussein, Head of Department of Chemical Engineering. And it is indeed a pleasure to welcome Professor Chris Jackson, Chair in Sustainable Geoscience, University of Manchester, to our Department of Chemical Engineering, Petroleum Geoscience at the University of the West Indies to deliver the seminar on looking inside volcanoes to our petroleum geoscience students. Our students are trained to understand the subsurface structure through our courses, well data field trips, maps, software training, and how to apply the earth and physical sciences, technology, engineering and regulations required to explore and drill for oil and gas and to quantify and produce oil and gas to the surface safely and economically with environmental considerations. As we progress our program, looking at the changes that are required to meet the energy transition that is taking place in our industries locally and globally, we also have to demonstrate how we can transfer our knowledge and experiences to meet that energy transition. And this seminar is very relevant to you and to us. And I would like to thank Dr. Anastasia Babulal for making this seminar possible to our students. Professor Jackson, welcome. And I will now ask Dr. Babulal to do the introduction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Hussein, for those words of welcome. Now, on to our main teacher, we are pleased to introduce our pre presenter today, Professor Chris Jackson. Chris Jackson is Chair in Sustainable Geoscience at the University of Manchester, a member of the Basins Research Group. He studied for his BSc and PhD on Rift Basin Development at the University of Manchester. He worked in the energy industry for Norsk Hydro, now Equinor, and spent 16 years at Imperial College London. Chris works in the general area of sedimentary basin analysis. When not studying rocks, Chris gives geoscience lectures to the public and in schools, having appeared on several earth science focused television productions and podcasts. Chris is engaged in efforts to improve equality, diversity, and inclusivity in higher education. Today with Professor Jackson, we are going to explore the topic, looking inside volcanoes. We hand you over now to Chris. Hello, thank you so much for the <clears throat> very kind words of welcome. I was just saying to Anastasia before we began that um, it's nice to kind of, this is probably gonna be my last talk as, a, as an academic um, and, um, you know, my, my parents are from the Caribbean. My mum is from Jamaica, my dad was from St. Vincent. So in some ways it's a perfect symmetry to all of this coming back home, um, if you will, to come and talk, give one of my last science talks as an academic. So um, absolutely honored to, um, to have been asked to come here today. So I'll share my screen and just confirm that you can see that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so what we're going to be talking about today is looking inside volcanoes and, and largely I'm going to be talking about how we can use geophysical data, so seismic reflection data, which 
you've been learning about on your course to understand um, several different aspects of crustal magmatism. So how rocks or material are melted down within the crust and how that material, that melt, that magma migrates through the crust and is eventually um, erupted at volcanic centers. And this is work I've been doing with a number of people, including uh, two on this first slide, Craig McGee and Chi Liang Sun, who I've been working with for, uh, for a number of years. I'm just going to see if I can get the laser pointer. Make sure that's the laser. Ah, here we go, yeah. Um, over a number of years on this topic. So let's get started. I'm going to kind of ease us gently into this with a few key definitions. I'm going to outline the tools. I'm aware that there's quite a broad audience here today. So I'm going to make sure that everybody is happy as we get into the, the heart of the talk. So when we talk about um, crustal magmatism or melting, we think about this, okay? So we have rock strata within a sedimentary basin. We can see here magma rising up through the Earth's crust, through those layered sedimentary rocks with the initial formation of a magma chamber. If we pause it there, we can see a number of different, um, a number of different uh, geological bodies that form through the crystallization, the cooling of that magma. We can see there's the magma chamber. We have these sub-vertical features in here, which are called dikes. We have these sub-horizontal sheets of cooled magma, which are called sills. We have this flat-bottomed, rounded-topped body um, here on the, on the left here, which is called a, a, a laccolith. And then we have obviously volcanoes. And we can see that you know, there's, there's a very rich network of features formed beneath and within that volcano or that volcanic province itself. One of the challenges is when we kind of fast forward in time, okay, so we're kind of watching that material, it stays there at the Earth's surface or in the Earth's subsurface for millions and millions of years. And then if we're lucky, um, what might happen is that, that that landscape will get eroded. So you'll see in a moment that the landscape will get, uh, let's get to there, will get eroded down. So let's pause it there. So now what you can see, we've exposed the laccolith at the Earth's surface, we've exposed part of the, this dike, and we've actually eroded out the, most of the volcanic edifice and we can see inside the volcano. So in some certain circumstances, if we're exceptionally lucky and we wait long enough, we will get a kind of quasi 3D insight into what the geometry of these volcanic provinces look like. But we haven't got that long to hang around, to wait for the Earth erosion engine to do its work and to expose these areas. Why, why does it matter? Why do we care about um, these, these sorts of features? Well, um, as you know, in the Caribbean, a, a lot of people live near volcanoes and volcanoes can be exceptionally hazardous. This here is El Popo, a very large volcano situated just outside of Mexico City, a city of around about 9 million people now. And you can see that there's this close interaction in terms of the geohazards between the humans and the natural processes occurring on Earth, in this case, this volcano. So it's really important to understand how these volcanoes are fed by magma. It's important to be able to forecast when they erupt and what type of eruptions might happen and where they may erupt from. These volcanoes are very big. They don't just erupt out of the same place all the time. So understanding how the magma is being fed into it is really critical. How do we do that? We can do it in a number of different ways. One way is by you know, what this hero is doing here. This is the classic geology field picture, isn't it, for getting people to come and do geology. There's somebody in a suit which is heat retardant on a, zero, on a lava flow in Hawaii, sticking a hammer in some freshly erupted lava. And what they're doing there is they're collecting lava, which we call a zero age sample. They're, they're going to cool it, they'll make a thin section and they'll look at the, the, the petrology, they'll look at the minerals within there to try and work out where this lava came from, like at what depth in the Earth's crust it melted, what its viscosity is, how fast it might be able to flow when it's erupted and, and various other properties that we're, we're concerned about. We might also look at the volcanic gases like carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. And what this person is doing here, they're sampling these gases coming out of a volcanic vent. And, and one reason we look at volcanic gases is because when we see changes in those levels of those volcanic gases within volcanic vents, it might mean that more magma is entering the volcanic system. So there might be magma rising up inside the volcano. So if we have a baseline reading of what in this case, sulfur dioxide and, and carbon dioxide is coming out of these volcanoes. When we see a big increase in those, the representation of those gases, it might mean that a volcano is proceeding towards an eruption. 
We can also use geophysical techniques. They're not gases, not rocks, but actually geophysics. We can actually look inside volcanoes this way. And this is just a cross section through um, Mount St. Helens in, in Washington State in the US. And you can see the Earth's surface in here. Just to give you an idea of scale, this is five kilometers in the horizontal in here, and this is five kilometers in the vertical. The red areas are where the seismic waves are traveling quite slowly. So the acoustic waves are traveling quite slowly through the crust. And the reason they're traveling quite slowly in these regions is this is where there's mush, there's partly molten rock or magma, if you will. And you can see that the shapes that are being formed by those slow patches of acoustic waves are kind of these, these, these blobs here, a deep blob and a shallow blob. And these are magma chambers, which have been imaged using, um, looking at acoustic wave speeds beneath Mount St. Helens. The blue colours, though, are where the seismic wave speed is quite fast. So the seismic waves are travelling quite quickly. And that's because that's areas of crystallised magma. So they're rocks. The blue is rocks, the red is magma. And you can see a smeared out picture down to about 10 plus kilometres within the Earth's crust of where the magma might be um, located beneath this volcano. But it's not really high resolution. We can try and improve our understanding by overlaying uh, earthquake epicentres on those geophysical images. So the pink circles here are all little earthquakes. And you can see those little earthquakes are defining a very well-defined um, column are underneath Mount St. Helens. And that's because that's the main highway, if you will, for magma rising up. And as the magma rises up, it breaks those rocks and generates earthquakes. So we're using here two different geophysical techniques. We're using seismology in terms of the looking at the earthquake uh, locations in here, but also um, kind of refraction or, or, or waveform data on the left-hand side, looking at the speed of the acoustic waves, not necessarily the energy being produced. The final way in which we can look at volcanoes is we could also use tilt meters. This is an old fashioned tilt meter. This is probably about as old as I am. But this is a this is a device that's mounted on top of a volcano. And when the volcano or the Earth's surface tilts, you can see that there's a plate in the middle and that plate always stays horizontal. So as the device itself tilts, um, that plate stays level, but there's an angle. So it's measuring the angle of deformation on the Earth's surface. So what does that mean in practice? So what we see is if we put a tilt meter on the edge of a volcano, as that volcano starts to inflate as magma rises up within it, we can see this blue box here has been tilted, and we see on this time versus tilt time series here that the tilt has increased, the volcano is about to erupt, we're really inflating the volcano, pushing against the sides, lifting it up, and we see a large amount of tilt now, and then eventually the volcano erupts and the tilt decreases. This is using these tilt meters, but we can equally use things like um, INSAR, so data from satellites from space. You know, we can actually look at the Earth's surface in millimeter scale precision and actually see how the Earth is deforming, not just at volcanic centers, but we can see subsidence in our cities as well with these sorts of data. But it's one way in which we can actually see that the, the real time migration of magma beneath and within volcanoes. So just to summarize the first bit, we have all these techniques, okay? We can look at gases, and we can look at geophysical data, and we can go to modern active volcanic provinces and use things like tilt meters or INSAR. So we can add all of those techniques together to come up with what I like to call a geophantasmogram. So these are these beautiful pictures we show students every day in Petrology 101 and say, this is what's happening beneath uh, volcanoes. We have all of the features that we talked about earlier on, sills, dikes, ring dikes, and magma chambers but they are geophantasmograms. The reason I call them geophantasmograms rather than disparagingly is because effectively these beautiful images are the sum total of all the observations we make from these different techniques, of course, right? I mean, they're, 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 uh, we've never seen this in reality. They're all patched together from case studies from different techniques, but it does act as a really inspiring melting pot for everything we do as geologists, doesn't it? Geophysics, geochemistry, petrology, petrography. So given that, what if we could also add to our knowledge in that respect? If we could image and reconstruct ancient magmatic systems in their entirety, so looking at the things that are intruded beneath volcanoes, we can look at the way the earth deforms as those intrusions are occurring, and we could look inside the volcanoes themselves. If we had such a framework, then what we'd be better placed to do is look at other observations, such as geochemistry, petrology, petrography, and understand them a bit better, right? Because at the moment we have this rather abstract 
you know, we have a hand sample we pick up from a zero age lava sample or we go and get a sample from the field or we get some geochemical reading. It's really important to know exactly what the plausible geometries are of what the magma system may have looked like beneath these volcanoes. And this is what we'd really like to know. And, you know, what if we could X-ray the Earth? That would be the holy grail, wouldn't it? That's what we'd all aspire to is if we can look inside the Earth in the same way as we look inside our bodies when we're not feeling very well. So what type of data is this is going to allow us to, to get to what we said on the previous slide? Well, we want the data to be high resolution. We want to be able to see like quite small, subtle things. We need the data to be aerially extensive because these volcanic provinces are huge. You know, we want to be able to image them in their entirety. Volcanoes are big, as are the systems that feed them. We need the data to be cheap to analyze because we're academics. We don't have a lot of money. We can't go out and collect and do lots of sample processing. So we just need to do things on the cheap. And I'm going to argue in this talk that one of the best um, types of data to do this are seismic reflection data. And this is just a kind of image from the Salisbury Crag in Edinburgh, where there's a volcanic um, body um, here, and then there's some reflection seismic data on the right here. But I am well aware that everybody on this call may not know a lot about um, seismic reflection data. Some of you will know a large amount about seismic reflection data. And undoubtedly, some of you on the call probably know more than me. Um, but I thought I'd get us all up to speed with the complete idiot's guide to reflection seismology. So um, I'm going to tell you now about what those images are. You know, what are those images and, and why do why does seismic reflection data, why is it so perfect for understanding um, magnet, crustal magnetism and, and looking inside volcanoes? So this is a seismic reflection experiment. It's a marine acquisition. We can see a boat sailing across the water with a source of acoustic energy behind the boat. And in this case, it's what we call an air gun. It's a large bubble is, is generated behind the boat. Acoustic waves travel down into the Earth's surface and bounce back off the rock layers. And they're recorded at these things trailing behind the boat called um, hydrophones. So these are trailing in the water uh, behind the boat. And the boat sails backwards and forwards letting off this bang and effectively profiling the uh, layers of rock beneath the seabed. What's really important for this technique is the amount of energy that comes back from those rock layer interfaces. And one really important thing there is called the reflection coefficient. And that's the ratio between the amount of energy going down into the earth versus how much is coming back up reflected from those rock layers and recorded. So that's that ratio. What controls that ratio is something called acoustic impedance. And that's the acoustic impedance between the two rock layers. So let's take, for example, this um, light brown layer here and this dark brown layer here. But what's acoustic impedance, you ask? Well, acoustic impedance is the product of density and velocity. So when we have changes in the density and velocity of rock layers, that's associated with changes in their acoustic impedance. And obviously, if the acoustic impedance changes between rock layers, we have a different ratio between the amount of energy going down and coming back up. We have more energy being absorbed or not within those, uh, those rock boundaries. So what we really care about with this technique to a, a significant degree is the density and velocity of the rocks that are beneath our feet. It just so happens, of course, that igneous rocks are perfect then, aren't they? Because igneous rocks are crystalline. And as you can see on this table here, which is showing you the velocity, so the, the speed in which those sound waves travel through the rocks, igneous rocks are much faster acoustically than sedimentary rocks. Okay, so five, above five and a half kilometers per second compared to two to five for most normally very deep sedimentary rocks. Why is that? Well, that's because igneous rocks are crystalline, right? They're crystalline, meaning they've got an interlocking um, um, texture. So the sound waves go very efficiently through those igneous rocks. Sedimentary rocks have pores. They have space in them, meaning a lot of the energy is dissipated within that pore space, meaning they're less efficient carriers of that acoustic energy. So you can imagine if we encase igneous rocks within sedimentary rocks, we'll have a huge change in acoustic impedance and we'll get lots of energy coming back off the boundary between the igneous rock and the sedimentary rock. So hopefully this slide has convinced you that you know, this technique is really, really good for looking at igneous rocks encased in sedimentary rocks because of the physical properties of both of those different lithology types. So let's start off. Let me give you an example. This is the bike base in offshore southern Australia. So I'm going to take you all the way from Trinidad, uh, all the way from Manchester, where I am, all the way to offshore southern Australia, as you can see in the map in the top right. 
Northwest is to the left, southeast is going to be towards the right, just for scale, really important on all of my images is the scale. This is 10 kilometers for scale, so you're looking at a large slice of data. This is 400 milliseconds two way time. So just convert that to meters. This is, in, this is a time migration, but at the velocities we're talking about here, you can convert that. So that's 400 meters vertically. So this line is grossly vertically exaggerated. The gray layer in here is water. This layer in here is the seabed, and these stripy layers underneath here are the, uh, are the sedimentary rock layers, going all the way down from recent, all the way down into some part of the upper Cretaceous. What I want you to focus on now are these high amplitude bodies in here. You can see these patches of high amplitude reflectivity here, as well as here. And also I want you to notice these triangular bodies here on top of this blue reflection that I've marked in here. So these things in here are igneous sills. These are igneous sills which have been in, in place within, this is a coal bearing coastal plain sequence. So this is a non-marine host rock, which has been intruded by igneous um, sills. You know, I always make the joke, if, it, if, it, if it's got a bill, it waddles and it quacks, it's probably a duck. Um, these triangular bodies here are volcanoes, okay? So they are volcanoes sitting above their coeval uh, intrusive system that fed them. And I'm going to take you on a little tour of this line. And as we go towards the southeast, you see there's lots of these igneous intrusions buried in the upper Cretaceous host rock. We see these large volcanoes in here. This one's almost half a kilometer high, a basal diameter of about 10 kilometers, so the size of a, of a, of a town. And here we have another igneous sill in this really beautiful laccolith. You can see this laccolith has got a flat bottom and a rounded top. Now, I want you to focus on um, this blue horizon. Can you see how it's folded above the top of this, this laccolith and this sill? That's the ground deformation which accommodated the intrusion of these igneous bodies. Now, what's important is the age of this blue horizon. It's the Prisian, it's Middle Eocene age. Okay, so this, you're looking at Middle Eocene intrusions offshore southern Australia. We know it deformed to the seabed. You can see the folds here because there's this onlap, we call it, this thinning. You can see these stratigraphy of thinning onto these, these domes, these domes which formed above these igneous intrusions. And because of that, we know that the igneous intrusions were in place between 200 and 700 meters beneath the seabed. So we can actually do lots of things. We can work out the age. We can work out what depth these things were in place in as well. And these volcanoes are obviously sitting on that middle Eocene horizon, so they're the same age. They were erupted onto the middle Eocene seabed. These are submarine volcanoes. We know that from the, the fact that these sediments, which are onlapping the volcanoes, are um, marine carbonates, actually, so they're, they're, they're nullable. So we can, see, we can see all of those things. So already, hopefully, this one slide, I can finish the talk, right? We can see the igneous intrusions, we can see the igneous extrusions, and we can also see the ground deformation, which associated the, the, the former, which are, which associated with the igneous bodies being in place. So we can see all of those components and work out the timing of intrusion, because we have well data as well, which tell us the, the age of these reflections. Just to communicate to you what that ground deformation is a bit more. So I've talked about it very statically. I've said, you know, that the, these igneous intrusions are in place and the ground deforms. You can probably imagine that, right? You, you inflate a, a balloon in the sand, the sand rises up, right, because it's, it's basically making space, in that case for air, but in this case for magma. I just want to show you this um, physical model from uh, Sam Popper, which was done a few years ago. What you're looking at here is a, is a cross-section in a CT scanner, the same thing you'd put your cat or cow or yourself in if you're not feeling very well. But we can also do physical models inside CT scanning devices. The field of view across this is probably, a, it's actually about 30 centimetres, so it's not very big. And what you've got, what you're looking at here is, is clay, it's a clay pack. What we're going to pump in the bottom here is not really magma, because it's magma several hundred degrees. We're going to be pumping in a magma analogue, and that magma analogue is golden syrup, which is a viscous material, but used, it actually acts like, a, an, a, a, acts like magma if we intrude it. So I'm just going to play that video, and you'll see... Here's the magma coming in, and can you see the dome forming at the top surface of the model? You see the top surface of the model went up. I'll play it again. So we intrude. Pause. You can see there, there's that uh, intrusive body in there. This is something what we call a saucer-shaped um, sill, so because it's like a saucer, it's like a bowl-shaped sill. It's not a perfectly flat sill. It has inclined limbs. You can see as well, really nicely, 
the uplift at the surface. And can you see as well these fractures? These are these are normal fractures. These are actually mode one opening fractures, we call them. But we can get normal faults as well, so mode three shear fractures. And if I just show you the, that model again, but from its top surface, so now I want you to keep an eye on the top right of this slide. X to X prime is the cross section you were looking at there, but now you're looking down on the top surface of the model. And there's the dome forming. Oops, always tricky to stop. There's the dome, which is the dome you're seeing here in cross section. And you can see that beautifully intricate pattern of fractures at the top. So that's what I'm talking about in those seismic examples. That's that ground deformation. And that's the stuff which tilt meters are reading in modern volcanic provinces. It's the fact that you know the, the ground is changing shape because there's magma coming into the system. And we can see that in reflection seismic data sets. Let's just return to the bite basin, and, and I just want to use the next two slides before moving on to looking at um, dikes to, to kind of convince you that it's not just pretty pictures. We can actually extract quite large amounts of quantitative data from these sorts of images. So what you're looking at here is the dike, uh, sorry, is the sill and lacolith pair that you saw on the previous slide. So um, let's get the pointer. So there's the sill with its little fold. And there's that lacolith with its much bigger fold. The reason the folds are bigger above the lacolith are for two reasons, right? The lacolith, as you can see, is thicker, so the ground has been uplifted more, but also the lacolith was intruded at a more shallow depth than the sill. So obviously, if you add more material at a shallower depth, the uplift is greater. And we can see now, if you look a bit more closely, there's some normal faults in the top of this dome. What we did is we went away and measured the, um, the thickness of the, of, the, of the lacolith across its um, width. And we did this for a lot of different intrusions, but I'm just going to show you the data for, for this particular lacolith. And we compared it to the amount of uplift above the lacolith. Because remember, when we're in modern volcanic provinces and we're trying to forecast when a volcano may erupt, what's really important is how we interpret uplift of two centimetres or one centimetre. What does that mean? Does it mean the magma has been intruded at 100 meters beneath the Earth's surface or 500? How much magma is there? You know, so we want to have quantitative relationships between the amount the ground is deforming and the thickness or the volume of material that's being intruded. And that's what you're seeing here. So on the x-axis is distance, and that's distance across the lacolith, across the lacolith fold pair. So let me just go back. So you're looking at a graph which is essentially going from here across to this side. That's from zero to 10 kilometers. So this is a rather big lacolith, you know, over 10 kilometers in, in diameter. And what you're looking at on the y-axis here is fold amplitude or intrusion thickness. So fold amplitude is in is the black um, squares and intrusion thickness are these open diamonds. And you can see the lacolith shape. There's one bump and then there's the other bump. And overall, there's a good relationship, isn't there? Where we see that the intrusion is thicker there is more uplift of the Earth's surface. But that relationship is not one-to-one, -one, is it? The ground deformation, the intrusion uplift, or the fold amplitude as it's written here in black, is always lower or less than the intrusion thickness. You can see that. So, you know, where we see um, an intrusion which has a thickness of about 65 metres, the amount of uplift of the Earth's surface is 38. And we saw this in a lot of different studies we've done. We always see that there's left uplift than there is the amount of magma that's been intruded. And we think that's because the rocks are deforming in different ways. Ima imagine you have some sedimentary rocks which have pore space, they have coal, they have water, they have some gas maybe even in them. When you're intruding that with magma, the rocks aren't forced to just deform by uplifting. They can actually, the pores can collapse, the water can be expelled, the coal can be degassed or uh, devitrified. So there's lots of other what we call deformation mechanisms which can accommodate uplift of the Earth's surface before you have to start pushing the, the roof up as the magma comes in. And so we think that when we're reading these, um, when we're reading these um, geodetic data, these, these ground deformation data, in, in when we're doing volcano forecasting and, and modelling, we need to be really aware of the rock types that are being intruded and how they deform, because that will ultimately control how we relate the amount of uplift to the volume of magma being intruded. So that's kind of the, the takeaway point for, for that slide, hopefully. 
So I've talked now about um, a lot about um, the sills and these, these sub-horizontal intrusions, and I want to take you on to looking at um, dikes. So now there's a time for a bit of a musical uh, sting. So you can relax for the next minute and a half and watch some beautiful scenes from Iceland. So they were the beautiful scenes from the Barabunga fish eruption in 2014 in Iceland. And you saw the huge lava fountains coming up. You saw the big elongate um, and kind of pools of magma. The reason the pools there were elongate is because that was a dike fed eruption. It wasn't coming from a sill. It wasn't really a volcano per se. It was actually being fed by one of these sub horizontal sheets of magma like we see here. And, you know, dikes are kind of really impressive. They're sub vertical sheets. Um, as you can see in here, sometimes, you know, a few tens of metres thick, but often less than that. But we say dikes, damn dikes. Why do we say dikes, damn dikes? Well, it's because, remember, the size of reflection um, tool we want to use um, relies on the rocks being sub-horizontal, not sub-vertical. Because the way we profile those rocks is by getting acoustic energy reflecting back off a common interface, and then we do some stacking and some other stuff. But you know, it works better with sub-horizontal rocks than these sub-vertical rocks because these sub-vertical rocks have an infinitely narrow point to image at their top, so we can't often see them in reflection seismic data. But there are some cases where we can see dikes, and I'm just going to show you a couple of examples that have been worked on where dikes have been imaged in reflection seismic data. So I'll take you to just offshore um, where I am here, the Silver Pit Basin in the offshore uh, UK. This is a size reflection profile. Again, scale is important in here. I've kind of covered it up in here, but this is five kilometer scale bar is about this in here. So you're looking at quite a long seismic line. One second two-way time there, approximately one and a half kilometers in the vertical. You can see a syncline, an anticline, and a syncline in these layered rocks in here. These layered rocks in here are Cretaceous. And the top of this, the very bright reflection here is the top of the Cretaceous. What then I hope your eyes drawn to, apart from all this salt down in here, this is Triassic salt, is are these weird things in here. Can you see these, these transparent pipes? There's these zones where, for some weird reason, the reflections in the, in, the, in the Cretaceous just disappear. And if we zoom in on one of those at the top of the feature marked A, and um, there's the scale again, we can see there's one of these weird zones where there's... Um, there's, there's no, re the reflectivity is much poorer and there's a downward deflection in the reflection, downward deflection of the reflection, that's the tongue twister, a downward deflection of the reflection here uh, in the Cretaceous strata. So you can see this really odd, um, odd seismic feature, we should say. I'm now going to show you a map of the top of the Cretaceous. So I'm going to show you a map which is based on this black reflection here to see what geometry is defined by these at that level. And this is what you see. So um, the red in here that I'm tracing out, this feature here and this feature here, these are the um, axes of anticlines. And this feature in here, this greeny blue color in here is where it's, it's deep and that's the axis of the syncline. So you're looking at synclines and anticlines kind of coming out of the screen and into the screen away from you, towards you and away from you respectively. Having defined that structural template, which you saw on the profile um, on the last slide, can you see these, these circular features? Can you see these circular pits in here? And remember the video from Iceland. Do you remember there was lava coming out of these, these, the, these big these sheets of magma or lava were coming out? And then there were these like circular features, which the magma was pooling or the lava was pooling it. These we think are the same things. We think that these are um, what we call pit chain craters, these, these circular features, which are a kilometer or so wide. We think they're formed at the upper tips of dikes that have been intruded into the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. So these are ancient image dikes. And what we think we're actually seeing is shown here. 
that dikes, when they rise up through the Earth's crust, they eventually intersect or they can intersect with the water table. And when magma hits water, it undergoes an explosive reaction. It, it cools catastrophically. And when you get a big bang and lots of degassing of that, that magma, you generate these craters, which are called, like I said a moment ago, pit chain craters. And we see these on Mars. We see them on other planetary bodies. We see them all across Earth in active and inactive volcanic provinces. So that's what we think we're seeing here are the seismic expression of pit chain craters, which then mean that these features underneath them are igneous dikes. So what's interesting here is we're seeing the igneous dikes not because they're sort of being imaged by the seismic reflection data, they're kind of being imaged by the fact that they're invisible, <laughs> number one, and they're imaged as well because they're associated with this geomorphic feature here, these pit chain craters. So they're quite different to the sills I showed you earlier on, which we saw were very high amplitude. We could see them cutting through the rock layers and sub-horizontal with the rock layers. Here we have this much narrower, more cryptic feature, these dikes, but we can still infer their presence from their seismic expression in the related geomorphology. There are times where you can see dikes more directly. This is from uh, offshore um, Norway. Um, again, for scale, there's one kilometre. And what you're looking at here is uh, the seabed is just at the top of this image. Um, and this is a half graph, and you can see that the sediments are thickening to the world, the right-hand side. There's a bunch of normal faults in here. What I want to draw your attention to are these things. Can you see how all the sedimentary rock layers are all dipping from north to south? So here, here, all of these here, down in here. But then maybe the eagle-eyed amongst you can see that there's some reflections which are actually dipping to the north. There's some which are actually dipping the opposite way. And there's a really nice one. I'll trace it out carefully for you here. We interpret these as igneous dikes. And we think they're igneous dikes because regionally there's good evidence that there was um, igneous activity around this time, so kind of in the, the late, kind of latest Permian, if you will. Um, so the, the, the question is, is why, why are we seeing these dikes in seismic data? Because remember I said that the seismic reflection um, technique is not particularly good at seeing these things. Well, these dikes are dipping. <laughs> so what we think has happened is this. We think the dikes were in place sometime at the end of the uh, Permian, you know, sometime beginning of the Triassic, and they were sub-vertical, just like the ones we saw in the North Sea. They were, they were upright. And so if we came there in the early Triassic and did a seismic reflection experiment, we might not have seen these dikes at all, okay, because they were narrow and they were vertical. But they were intruded in a tectonically active basin. You can see there's a half grab that had already formed at this point in time in the Permian. We think that what happened through the Jura Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous is that that fault, which is here, you can see it here, was active and it actually rotated those dikes. So those dikes went from being vertical or sub-vertical to actually dipping. And because they're dipping, we can actually image them with a seismic reflection technique. Now, that image is massively vertically exaggerated, right? So you probably still think they're quite shallow because this is one kilometre for scale and this vertical scale in here is about two or three kilometers. So there's a huge vertical exaggeration here. So if you take that vertical exaggeration out, those dikes are only dipping about 15 degrees. So they're incredibly gently dipping now, but they were much more steeply dipping to start with. So that rotation, as shown here, was critical to us being able to see present day these dikes in this particular basin. So just to conclude the talk, I've moved us all the way from the kind of feeder systems for volcanoes that are inside or below volcanoes into the volcano themselves. And this is Colima in Mexico. And volcanoes are super cool, of course, but they're dangerous. They're hard to instrument with seismic reflection experiments. They're often in challenging geographical or geopolitical locations. So, you know, can we use seismic reflection data to better understand active volcanoes? and in particular by looking at um, ancient volcanoes with these techniques. And we think we can, you know, again, going back to the Bight Basin, um, you know, we get images like this. So before we looked at the laccoliths and the sills, but here we're looking at the volcano. This is a volcano with a relatively large basal diameter. Um, the green horizon here, again, is that it was blue, unhelpfully, in the earlier slide, but that's that Middle Eocene horizon we looked at earlier on. There's some sills, you can see these high amplitude sills sitting below the volcanoes within the upper Cretaceous host rock. And then here are the volcanoes themselves with the black horizon defining the top of the volcano. 
And then there's these um, carbonates which are um, fossilizing the volcanoes. If you look in detail within the volcano, you can see um, these dipping reflections here. So actually we can see reflections within the volcano, which I still think is pretty cool. And what we think we're seeing here within the volcano are actually lava flows. We actually think what we're imaging here are lava flows interbedded with marine sediment. So remember, when volcanoes erupt, they can be monogenetic, they can just form in one eruptive period. But oftentimes volcanic eruptions are, are staged or staggered. You have a period of eruption separated by periods of sedimentation and, and erosion. And we think what we're seeing here on the edges of the volcano, on the lower flanks, is where we've built up lava and hyaloclastite sediments. So sediments that formed um, like pyroclastic material in, in the submarine setting. We think that the internal part of the volcano is more transparent because that's very intruded. It's densely intruded. A lot of the magma was rising up through the heart of the volcano, coming out the top, flowing down the volcano and constructing the volcanoes we see in here. So, you know, we have a kind of simple sketch which sort of communicates that, you know, we think we see these lava flows and sediments in dark grey here and then more um, igneous rock dominated material towards the core of the volcano. By mapping those horizons in lots of detail internally, you can actually do really cool things like this. You can actually reconstruct the growth of the volcano by looking at the pre-eruptive surface, looking at how the, the, the volcano initially builds up from those lava flows, which are quite sheet-like, before then, as you see in the next few um, additions, you can see now the volcano is growing by summit eruptions. So you can see here the volcano is growing by an increase in its height, but also an increase in its basal diameter. And there's the final morphology. So I think it's always really cool that you can go back to these Eocene volcanoes and by carefully dissecting them with reflection seismic data, you can see how these volcanoes behave over their geological evolution. And in this case, this was a volcano that was associated with um, just continual summit eruptions. There were other eruptions, other volcanoes we looked at in this particular area where um, we saw lots of flank eruptions. So that's where lava comes out the side of the volcano rather from the top. And we could see that only because we have reflection seismic data because we can actually look inside the volcano. Otherwise, you'd only see the top surface and you wouldn't really know what the kinematics of the eruption were. Some of the volcanoes, just a couple of images just to finish. Some of them are really cool. This is um, a tiny baby volcano, which you can see again is Eocene. It's sitting on that green horizon here. It's only, you know, maybe 100 meters high. Uh, you can even see little lava flows within this volcano. But what's really neat about this one is you can see it was fed by a sill. So you can see there's a sill, it's the tip of which is here, and then you can see this, this zone of seismic, um, chaotic seismic reflections here. And we think that this is the conduit for rising um, hydrothermal fluids, maybe some magma, and also some material eroded from the host rock walls up into the volcano. So we think that this, this was a sill-fed eruption. So it wasn't an eruption fed by deeply sourced magma, we think it was an eruption that was fed by relatively shallowly in place sill. We know the sill was relatively shallow because of this. Can you see the green bump here? There's a fold. And so we actually can see this ground deformation, what we call a forced fold, above this sill. So we know exactly the, the depth at which the sill was in place, and we know exactly where its tip was when it fed this volcano. So really shallow magma dynamics. Some uh, volcanic eruptions, though, like this one here, is kind of like what we call a shield volcano, a very low angle volcano. You can see these things which look like clinoforms, they sort of are, They're, it's kind of a hyaloclastite delta. But you can see that this volcano sits right at the top of a normal fault. And so we think here the magma rose up this, this normal fault, which had lower permeability than the host rock either side. And when the magma reached the upper fault tip and the seabed, it, it started to build out a um, a effectively a lava delta into the shallow um, shelf um, and we could see that this is these are kind of a bit tricky to explain but these are basically maps imagine you're looking at maps uh, of the eocene seabed and the gray is the volcano so the the reddish colors here are um, the eocene seabed it's effectively just the green horizon and the gray here is just where we've mapped the top of the volcano so we've just colored that gray to separate out those two things but you can see here here's that blob which is this lava delta and it's quite big you know it's like 10 kilometers long and it prograded five kilometers out into the into the, onto the shelf so to conclude what did we learn from seismic reflection data in the last uh, 25 slides or what did i hope 
um, you learned from seismic reflection data. You can tell me whether or not I've succeeded. I hopefully convinced you that the products of crustal magnetism are really well imaged using seismic reflection data. It's a tool we don't typically use. And if we use it, we can image and reconstruct all those different bits of the magmatic system, okay? The, the sills, the dikes, the volcanoes, and we can reconstruct that in relatively large, um, over relatively large areas at, at quite um, um, high resolution and, and you know, good detail. We can also um, relate um, the amount of ground deformation, those folds we saw, to the size of the magma bodies that drive volcanic eruptions. So again, you know, in modern volcanic provinces, you're often left to try and guess at what's underneath the ground from indirect signals of ground deformation, gas, some eruptions. Um, but, you know, with this, we can actually get a catalogue, if you will, of different relationships between different sizes of deformation and depths of bodies. And, you know, this is just to say, you know, we think that this data type is a really good way in providing a physical framework for a lot of what other geologists are doing, right? You know, geochemists, petrologists, petrographers, all of those different techniques which are being used to understand igneous systems better and seismic data should be used alongside those as well. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Hi, Chris. Uh, so thanks so much for that, for that talk. Um, I mean, you've taken us offshore, Australia, Norway, UK, <laughs> you were in Mexico. Um, so thanks, and, and, and for me, um, what was really interesting is getting getting to see those ancient volcanoes. So I don't know um, if our students, you know, really were able to connect with that. But being able to see ancient volcanoes is something I've never seen. I've never been able to see one. So um, bringing those seismic images to us was really, really powerful. So yeah, I should, I, should, I should add as well. Um... So I know you're doing petroleum geosciences. So in the UK, you know, there's a, there's another version of this talk which I give, which is on which uses different examples. But igneous rocks, such as what we've looked at today, are really important from a petroleum systems point of view. So offshore the UK in the the northeast Atlantic, you know, that's an area where there was huge amounts of crustal magnetism because of breakup of the North Atlantic. So all of the petroleum province there, one of the key challenges with understanding the petroleum province is how you deal geophysically and geologically with all of those igneous rocks. Because imaging underneath igneous rocks is really hard geophysically. Drilling through igneous rocks, which cover your reservoir, are really difficult. There's been discoveries of oil and gas made within the igneous rocks themselves, within fractures and within um, intralava sandstones. Um, so there's this... You know, like we've talked about it here in a much more of a blue skies geohazard point of view, but from a from a from an applied perspective, um, these are sorts of rocks that you are likely to come across in different basins around the world. Whether it's part of a, a continental breakup, like we've looked at largely products of here, but in other areas, there's lots of these sorts of bodies. In in New Zealand, um, there's two oil fields with, and in the Philippines, there's oil fields within volcanoes. So. The, the sills have, have, have matured the source rock by intruding the organic rich source rock. Gas, pretend, gra gas and to some degree oil has come off the source rock and migrated into the, the lavas in the volcanoes. And so there's a volcano called Cora, which has been really well drilled and studied, where there's, they're producing hydrocarbons from inside a volcano. And it's a beautiful shape like this. It looks just like the ones we looked at here. So they are economically important. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for thanks so much for that presentation. Okay, so any any questions from our students or members of staff that are on? Anyone? Nobody need nobody needs to be shy. Um, <laughs> and you can ask me questions about other things apart from the talk if you'd like to as well. I've got another ten minutes, so feel free to <clears throat> ask me what I had for breakfast or anything like that. <laughs> Guys, anyone? Oops. Yeah. Ariana. Ariana. Hi, good day. Chris. Hi, morning. I really enjoyed that talk. It was uh, it was really um, very interesting, and uh, it's different for us to see, as uh, Dr. Babalal said, um, volcanic um, features. Interestingly, offshore uh, Trinidad, we I recently learned that. We are offshore Tobago, we have buried volcanoes actually that you can image on. They have imaged them on seismic, but 
but I don't know. Um, I, I didn't look at it in detail to know if it caused um, defamation on, on CFIS. But I was curious, does the, is there a direct correlation then? You know, you showed this really nice video model of mm -hmm. defamation on CFIS. Um, has that been able to translate directly to specific geohazards or volcanic types? So like, you know, you described having basaltic volcanoes versus I guess something that might be more, more explosive. Do, does the defamation on surface also depend on the kind of magma type or is it just um, have to do with the pressure and type of intrusion? Yeah, that's a good point. So whether you have more silicic magmas or whether you have more basic magmas, so basaltic, rhyolitic and things, um, everything we've dealt with here um, has been largely um, basaltic melt. So that's just a kind of disclaimer for, for the studies. That just happens to be where we've got data from. Um, you would expect that the viscosity would have some control on the style of ground deformation, I think, because um, you know whether the, the magmas are gassier or whether they are more crystal rich will control, firstly, the amount of ground deformation, but then also the compaction behavior of the magma after it starts to crystallize and effectively cool. So I do think the, that would, I think theoretically it'd have a control, but I couldn't show you any data where we've directly controlled two very well-known cases where we have two contrasting styles of, of magmatic product. Has it been applied? Yes, Craig, who's one of the co-authors on this talk, has been trying very hard to convince some people who work, in, um, <laughs> who work on uh, volcano forecasting to take some of this work seriously, because what, what they do at the moment is, um, is it's going to sound ridiculous, but they have a shape of a volcano and then they have a ground deformation. They try and model it as a ball, often a circle. So they'll say, well, there's this ball and it's this dimension or it's this um, circumference or radius, whatever you want to say. There's a ball of this size and it's at this depth and this is the amount of ground deformation we see above it. But we know that geologically there are no balls of magma dynamically in the Earth's crust. What we do know is there are dikes, we know there are sills, we know there are laccoliths. So having more realistic shapes would likely contribute to, so number one is having more realistic shapes would like to contribute to a better understanding of okay we see the ground deformation what are the likely shapes and sizes and depths of those um the magma causing that deformation i think that's number one i think the other thing which again is kind of glossed over a bit in this talk but is something which i always get asked about is um we've looked at igneous um, intrusions into sedimentary rocks pretty much exclusively if you get to Iceland, of course, you've got igneous intrusions into igneous rocks because you've got a volcanic island and it's still magmatically active. And the, um, the physical properties of those igneous rocks, the, the, um, the, uh, the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the fracture behavior of those rocks and the mechanical properties, the rheology, if you will, of those rocks is very different. So the way in which those igneous rocks would accommodate the, the the magma being intruded will be different because igneous rocks can't compact at the grain scale like sedimentary rocks, for example. So one hypothesis would be if we imaged a forced fold above an igneous intrusion into igneous rocks, there should be a better match between the amount of magma intruded and the amount of ground deformation because there's no other way of accommodating the, 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 the volume of material in place. There's no pause to collapse. So it's a very good question. There are, there are a couple of different caveats in the work we've done, but they, they do provoke kind of additional questions. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank Anna. you so much. No yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so, well, if no one's going to ask a question, I, I'm, I'm going to. So Chris, in your, in your bio, you mentioned that you worked in an oil and gas company and I would say, and students have asked this, how, how does that square away with maybe talking about climate change um, or energy transition? Yeah, I think it's very hard, isn't it? I mean, it's a journey I've been on, obviously having worked in the oil industry before and having done research for the oil industry. Um, I think it's difficult. I think it's good if you're asking yourself the question, you're already quite a ways towards um, enriching your, your, yourself <laughs> and being more conscientious. Um, I think it's important to recognise that, you know, oil and gas is going to be needed in certain parts of the world um, for longer than in others, because economically, 
geopolitically. It's the only energy source which is reliable, which is affordable to those people. And we shouldn't forget that, you know, some gains we've made around equality around the world and social justice have arisen because people had access to energy. Um, in, you know, in the Millennium Development Goals before the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I think it's important to recognise the valuable contribution in some sense that oil and gas has made, but at the same time then realising that if we're going to get to a, a global solution for climate change and try and mitigate the, the worst impacts of fossil fuel consumption, we need to be applying our subsurface skills to other geoenergy things, right? So I think, I think, I think, it's, I think it's okay to have that thoughts. I think it's okay to even go and work in the oil and gas industry. I've chosen not to, right? I've chosen to go into a, a company who don't do that. Um, but equally, I can see why people would, you know, not least we've got to get paid, right? <laughs> you need to buy food and live somewhere. So there's a, there's a very, there's a, there's a pragmatism at play, of course, in all of these decisions. But, you know, if you have the privilege to think a bit more about it, and that's not the pressing concern, then you know, I think there is a there is a there is a case for still needing the fossil fuel position as we as we transition. You know, and I think I think there needs to be that recognition that there's going to be a transition for people to get behind it, right? I mean, if yeah. if it is a, what do you call it, the Trojan horse, you know, they just want to keep doing the same thing but pretend they're changing. That's not good. You know, I, I kind of draw the line before then and say. But I, I think um, I think at the moment we're, we're still okay. We're still maybe a few decades away from needing everybody out. Well, I say that, but then, you know, the news yesterday was all about 1.5 is dead, right? And we're talking about two degrees. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, maybe this is a question we should have been asking like 10 years ago to speakers. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. Um, any other questions from anyone? Okay, so Aaron, Aaron um, has a question. Oh, pleasant. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Um, with respect to sustainable energy, uh, I know a lot of people are driving towards um, well, not necessarily sustainable, but electric energy. Do you see other forms of sustainable energy being the main forms of energy, such as geothermal energy or solar energy in countries that may not be able to afford or, or transform themselves into a uh, mainly um, electric environment? but can use other forms of energy, such as geothermal, as you have explained, to yeah. um, kind of to suffice for the energy demand in that, those particular countries. Yeah, I think, that, I, think, I think it's a good point, Aaron. I think, um, you know, looking at the local geography and working out how that local geography may work for you as a country. Take Norway, right? Norway, it rains all the time, all the time, all the time, hardly ever sunny. But because it rains all the time and it's basically a massive mountain range, hydrothermal or hydroelectric energy in Norway accounts for 98% of the, of the energy electrical provision. It also helps that Norway's only got 5 million people in it, of course. But um, that's the geography and that's the climate situation there. Go to Morocco, where I was recently. You know, Morocco's got the largest solar photovoltaic you know, farms, solar farms, if you will, in the world. You know, they have all these different uh, things. Why? Because Morocco has some of the... It's one of the sunniest countries in the world and has some of the clearest skies. So the geography works there. It also is economically in a position like Norway. Well, Norway especially so. It's incredibly wealthy. Morocco is in a financial position where they can sort of do that. So you can see what I mean. If you go to different countries, you need to look at that local geography, try and understand, you know, what might be best for local production and, you know, for the local consumption required of that energy understand what would be best, you know, but then a lot of it's going to come down to, I guess, economics and investment, you know, who's willing to go there and invest in the capital to start up with that new infrastructure. Um, Trinidad, it looks where Anastasia is like very sunny and warm. So, you know, maybe that's a, and there are mountains and, and rivers. So maybe there's a hybrid mix in some countries, right, where there could be provision from both. Um, France has hardly any oil and gas, remember, it's a huge country. France has hardly any oil and gas production, but they have nuclear energy. So you can see what I mean. I think having some a slightly grown up set of thoughts about where are we, what do we have, what don't we have, what might we do that's kind of best fitting a sustainability agenda, that's the best you can do. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think like, I don't know, personally, I believe that's one of the fastest ways we could move away from the whole oil and gas industry 
and like actually make use of 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 those sources of energy because I don't think we actually uh put enough studies and and effort into as you said finding the optimum sources of energy for the respective countries then so yeah, yeah thank, because thank I you think- very much. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as well, one thing I find quite frustrating is that, you know, climate change is a global problem. You can have local um, policies that say, well, let's restrict emissions in this part of the world, but the climate is a global system, right? So you can't sort of fiddle in one place and do something because it's still going to be impacting on the other side of the planet. So I find that very frustrating that people almost piously say, well, we've done this in our country because financially we can do it. But actually, you know, like, you know, again, I'm kind of beating up on Norway a bit here but you know the Norwegians have 98% you know hydroelectric energy it looks great they drive around in Teslas looks fantastic but you know they all have like you know their per capita carbon footprint is enormous because they have like four houses and seven cars and 18 TVs and you know and then they're blaming overpopulation in in Africa for example right there's like these horrible horrible colonialist tropes around the problem is always on the other side of the fence. And I find that very frustrating when, you know, having a globally consistent set of thoughts about why we are where we are and what we need to collectively do to move forward. <laughs> I agree. I agree, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, at this time, um, we'll, we'll ask Aaron, um, who's a second year undergrad student in the Petroleum Geoscience Programme, to give the vote of thanks. Okay, um, hi again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, our distinguished guest speaker, uh, Chris, Professor Christopher Jackson, um, uh, Professor Rafi Hussein, Dr. Anastasia Babulal, all invited guests and colleagues. Uh, my name is Erin Mongo, as uh, Ms. Anastasia has said. I'm a, currently a year two student of the Petroleum Geoscience Program at UE, and I've been given the privilege to conclude the session with a vote of thanks. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank our esteemed guest speaker, uh, Professor Chris Jackson, Chair in Sustainable Geoscience at the University of Manchester for taking the time to further our educational understanding of the structure of volcanoes and the evolution of their underlying hot rocks with the use of the new 3D seismic imaging techniques and being able to showcase that for us to better understand and tie in with what we have learned here at UWE. Uh, with the changing world of energy use and consumption, you have definitely sparked a better understanding of the global needs and our role in this change as a geoscientist. You have provided us with answers to many questions and outlooks to many situations from your perspective and with your wealth of knowledge and experience that will provide invaluable to our careers. I would also like to thank Professor Rafi Hussein, the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of the West Indies for also taking the time out of his already busy schedule to extend a warm welcome to all of the proceedings attendees. Uh, additionally, I would also like to thank uh, the University of the West Indies and all of its personnel who were involved in the coordination of today's program. To our host, Dr. Anastasia Babalal, thank you for organizing and leading today's proceedings with your kind words and guiding tonality to ensure the smooth running of the program, as we have seen. And finally, I would like to thank my fellow colleagues and attendees for your individual attention and support and what I'm sure was a worthwhile experience. Uh, the information shared during this event will definitely be used to strengthen the geoscience program offered at UE in order to merge the pre-existing standards with the standards of a new and sustainable world. I also hope we were all able to grab a vital piece of information that we can use to propel our successes in our future endeavors. Uh, once again, Thank you to everyone who was able to make this event possible. Thanks. Thanks, Iran. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. No problem, sir. <laughs> Thank you again, Chris, so much for your presentation. Thanks to the students for attending and making this event possible. We really, really appreciate it. So keep safe, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, sir.